Uh, so w welcome everyone. Uh, just giving a few minutes to get everyone in the talk here. <laughs> oh, very cool. Wow. Okay, let's give it a few more minutes. Um, just to make sure everyone's here and then we'll we'll get started. Hmm. Wow. Jeez. Okay, well, I think I think most of us are here. So um, I'd like to start off by saying, uh, you know, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we are very excited to have uh, Trevor King be giving us uh, an artist talk. Um, so I think everyone is very familiar with Trevor. Um, he's been around Grand Charles Pottery for um, a long time. Trevor, when did you start as a studio technician? Uh, I think I started in 2017. Okay. But I'm, yeah. Um, but so Trevor was a studio technician. Um, he is now a uh, faculty member. And at the end of last year, he was a French House Pottery uh, Fellow. So we were uh, very privileged to have him back with us for a month as a, a fellowship artist. Um, and he is here today to tell you all about his um, art practice, as well as the project that he specifically worked on um, for that month at Greenwich House Pottery. So um, kind of the way we'll work this is Trevor's going to give his talk, um, and then uh, at the end we'll have a QA. and a um, If you have a question for Trevor while he is speaking, uh, if you just want to go ahead and put it in the chat so that you don't forget your question, um, then we can do a, a roundup of all the questions at the end. Um, so I think we had a few more people join us just then. Um, anyway, welcome everyone. Uh, and I'm going to pass it over to Trevor. Okay. Uh, well, first I just wanna say, you know, thanks everybody for uh, logging on here. It's just great to see so many familiar faces and, uh, you know, people that I, I miss seeing at the pottery more often. Um, and thank you uh, to Caitlin and Jenny and everybody at Greenwich House who's been so supportive in this project and for um, just for setting this up. So I'm gonna go ahead now and uh, try and share my screen and get my PowerPoint started. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, Caitlin, can, can you just let me know, does everything look and sound okay? Yeah, yeah, it's all looking and sounding great. Awesome, cool. Um, so uh, today what I wanted to go through is just some of my work uh, chronologically so that I can kind of look at um, the way that I've used sculpture making strategies, uh, personal, uh, personal material, found objects, and, um, and video making kind of all in concert with one another to try and tell human stories and make artwork that in different ways looks at the passage of time. And uh, before I do that, just to set the stage a little bit, I just wanna go through a couple of um, my favorite artworks so you can get sort of a sense of the things that I really love and just my type of thinking. Uh, this is a, an installation by British artist Mike Nelson, and it's sort of a, a 
two-part installation. And in this image, you see um, a projected slideshow of ab abandoned um, fire rings. Okay, this is another one. And then on the back side of this wall, there's um, a collection of sort of the last possessions of a friend of the artist who uh, passed away in a mountain climbing accident. And, you know, so the thing that I like about this work is just the kind of complicated way that it deals with loss and this sort of like primordial fire. And um, this is sort of typical of his work, these completely immersive psychological spaces. Uh, another artist that I really love is uh, Shannon Lockhart. This is a video piece and uh, titled Lunch Break. And through the course of the video, uh, the camera just pans through the hall uh, during the lunch break at a uh, shipyard. And you get sort of this rare, um, unaffected glimpse into this work site and uh, the people that occupy it. This uh, sort of investigation is pushed farther with these series of uh, lunch boxes and their containers. Uh, just a series of photographs and then titled based on uh, whose lunchbox it is and what their, uh, what their job is. And I just find it so interesting, you know, what you can sort of tell uh, through these materials about kind of the, the culture that we live in or, you know, about these individuals. Another great work by Shannon Lockhart. This is, um, you know, a drywaller at a gallery uh, between exhibitions uh, and, you know, literally kind of elevated by their own uh, work tools, uh, but also shown in, uh, you know, sort of this honor honorable sort of way. And what I like about these uh, pieces is that there's an element of nonfiction that uh, is negotiated in the work. And I see it as a uh, continuing, you know, the sort of trajectory that was perhaps uh, begun in this painting, Burial at Ornans by Courbet, where it's this sort of scene of daily life and of everyday people, um, maybe a, a somber scene, but it's elevated to the sort of the scale uh, that would be typically reserved for heroic imagery, um, story painting, something like that. And so this sort of shift towards honoring the beauty and struggles of every day. And um, I mean, I'm interested in these things because of where I grew up. Uh, this is where I'm from, Butler, Pennsylvania. And uh, it's sort of a mill town uh, in beautiful rolling hills of Western PA. This is Armco or AK Steel. Uh, this is where my father worked for 32 years for his most of his career. And, um, you know, growing up in this region, there was sort of, uh, well, I'll just say that, you know, from the 1950s to the 2000s, there was a 58% job loss. So there was sort of this permeating um, sense of uncertainty and the stillness that um, I think affected the culture that I grew up in, in really profound ways from, from that deindustrialization that was happening. And, you know, this is documented in kind of the, the cultural outputs of, of the place. Uh, these are covers for um, documentaries made by Rick Seabach, who uh, would make all these incredible uh, documentaries that were shown on uh, public television. And, um, you know, just look at the titles, things that aren't there anymore and stuff that's gone. And uh, this is Rick Seabuck himself. And it's not like these videos were like uh, extremely somber or mournful or anything like that. They're actually very endearing, uh, sweet, and, and just kind of indulging in these like really quirky, uh, special aspects of the local community. Yeah, this is another uh, DVD of his work. And, you know, this, these are just some images from my phone. This is uh, Daffin's Candies in Greenville, Pennsylvania. And, you know, what do you do when you're a, uh, you know, small family-owned business that's like trying to compete with Walmart? Well, you know, maybe you make uh, 
massive chocolate animal sculptures in this sort of back room of the store so that everyone can come in and see the, sh the showroom. So I just really love this sort of uh, improvisational sculpture. And so um, beginning, you know, to make my work, I was sort of, I was absorbed in, in that place and trying to find a way to negotiate it in my work, find a way to, to talk about the people uh, that I knew. And, um, but immediately found myself in the pot shop. And uh, so this is a very old uh, bottle that I made and um, uh, not something that I typically share in my presentations, but I thought for the Grand Chelsea audience, this might be interesting. But this is kind of, this is uh, sort of where I started. And I was super into uh, just the texture, uh, the idea of something looking like an artifact, uh, but more so I was into the, the studio. I liked the kind of, workshop feeling of the place and I like this idea that I could develop this practice and just go down there and uh, put some labor in and revisit that over and over again that there was something sort of enriching in that um, oh yeah this is so this is our studio um, in in undergrad this is Slippery Rock University uh, my friend Derek Len Martin and Quinn Heulings on the right here you can see that there's a uh, concert happening in the pottery shop. And, you know, so it was just that kind of setting that I that I liked, but I was looking in my work for um, a, a way for it to be a little bit more narrative. And, um, you know, I was, I was making pottery, but I was never that interested in functionality. So I, I was thinking that I want my work to function uh, as a sort of storytelling agent or as a way of recording, um, daily life. And so I, I kind of moved away from pottery for a little bit. And this was uh, a sculpture that I made with found objects. Uh, the brush that is sort of placed like a torch here was a uh, plastering brush. Uh, it was my, my grandfather's from his uh, sort of, he was a plastering contractor as his side job, uh, my, my father's dad. And uh, this is, this work is, composed of many elements that are pieced together with the help of other people. Uh, for instance, like the, the plaque, the, the uh, hardwood plaque on the back, I didn't know how to route that out. So I uh, got my uncle's help, you know, who was, who's a carpenter. Um, the work glove, that was my dad's from work in the steel mill. And then there's the, uh, the brush, that was my grandfather's. And all I really did was the, ugly welding job uh, on the steel in the sort of middle of it. And I titled this employee of the month and um, I just thought it was, you know, in sort of a tongue in cheek way back then, kind of a way of like honoring uh, labor in a, in a place where maybe the value in that was unknown or un uncertain. And, um, now this is, uh, my brother has this piece. He's a uh, sociology professor and this is in his office where he teaches in South Carolina. And so moving on from that piece, I thought that there, something really unlocked when I started using these objects that I was kind of uh, fi finding in the garage, like, you know, things that sort of existed in um, my family. And so this was uh, the first exhibition that, I did. Um, in the center, you can see these plastering tools, uh, more of my grandfather's plastering tools. Um, and in, in the back right, sort of this reconstructed zombie Frankenstein tree uh, that I made from just things I was finding in the woods, just, you know, logs and fallen twigs, piecing it back together. Uh, I like that, you know, I was sort of self-conscious at the time that like, you know, this ladder was my grandfather's and had the name signed on there. And now it feels like a sort of Sterling Ruby kind of move where it has the, the very bold signature. Um, and a part of this exhibition was a video piece titled Three Painters. And this was made with uh, three of my 
my coworkers who I worked on a painting crew with for four years. And uh, this was while I was in art school. And I would go from like painting class to, to painting work. And I would start, you know, I'd be like painting dorm rooms and parking lots and things like that. And so uh, I wanted to do this piece where I interviewed each one of them individually and just asked them about kind of their, what their work was like as painters and then uh, show them simultaneously so that when you stand back, you get these kind of overlapping narratives and uh, individual kind of insights and in, into these people and the way that they viewed their work and never making it um, clear what type of painting they were doing. With Burns Lake, I uh, continued this sort of investigation into using uh, materials from kind of familial materials. This piece was based on a recorded audio tape like a letter that uh, my grandfather created in 1990 when he was camping in Florida. And what I was sort of interested in is creating, imagining the setting that it was recorded in and creating it. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, try and play this segment of audio so you can get a sense of what it uh, sounded like. And also I should say, you can see the computer uh, up in the top part of this image. That is sending this audio file to his radio with an FM transmitter. Um, and it's playing this recorded bit of audio in, in the sculptural site, okay? So. The music you just heard was from Ralph here at the fire, at the campfire and uh, it's on an organ, keyboard organ that he has, and we have a generator run it. Uh, the popping you hear in here is from the campfire, the wood popping when it's burning. Uh, we have possibly uh, 70, 80 people sitting around the campfire here. It is a beautiful, beautiful evening out here, down here at Burns Lake on this Monday evening. And the moon is shining out over the lake here. Uh, the stars are shining. It is a grand, grand night. A good night to be alive. And now we'll go back in and hear another song. Okay, and so at the, the core of this piece, there's a sort of consideration with sculpture where how do you describe a place by making something that is static. Um, and I think there's a sort of a friction between the segment of audio uh, and then the, the built sort of tableau that I created. Okay. Um, moving forward, you know, after, uh, this is sort of after I moved away from Pennsylvania, I was living in Michigan, just outside of Detroit and um, I had gone to a, a demolition derby and I was thinking about these objects as uh, kind of descriptive, you know, objects of, of the landscape and of the culture. And I was thinking like, man, one of these cars just sort of with ferns growing up all around it, like that's a really great public sculpture, you know, I should make that. And you know, so then there's the sort of thought process of like, well, do I carve it out of like foam or model it in clay or something? You know, how do, how do you make a uh, demolition derby car? And ultimately, also, um, there's this piece by Charles Ray, Unpainted Sculpture, uh, that I, I've always loved. I think it's an incredible um, execution of craftsmanship where this wrecked car is all um, taken apart, molded, cast in uh, fiberglass and then put back together. And, you know, I just think this piece raised a lot of questions where it's like, who, you know, who is this about? Or like, what, what actually happened here? Um, and so my thinking was, well, if I'm gonna make a, a sculpture like that, I think the best thing to do would be to, to get a car and um, compete in a demolition derby and use the event 
the actual event that's happening as the kind of tool uh, to make those marks on this object. And I'm showing this uh, in this talk just because of the way that I'm sort of interested in immersing myself into situations to make work. You know, I wasn't ever exactly sure where this was going, but I just, I thought if I just place myself in this thing that's actually happening, you know, something will come out of it. And um, yeah, this is my dad. I don't actually know anything about cars and uh, mechanical stuff. And so uh, my buddy Nick here, he came up to help me out and uh, my dad. And so we were building it out. And then you can see that the yellow car there, uh, that is me in the Derby. And then ultimately this was shown in exhibition just as the vehicle, uh, the vehicle as a sculpture and then a two channel video where you sort of see the, um, you see the event from one perspective on the left side in the passenger seat watching me driving the car and uh, from the other perspective on the right hand side uh, you see just um, the view from the grandstands. And the video shows the entire event from start to finish. So it's uh, about 30 minutes long. You see us all pulling onto the track and then the kind of uh, collisions and all of this, and then eventually being towed away. Okay. Um, it was after this piece, uh, I had an opportunity to work with Anthony Gormley. And what was profound for me was the way that he would talk about making his sculptures where each one of these was cast from you know, a lived moment where he stood there and someone wrapped a uh, burlap and plaster all around him and made a mold of him. And that, you know, he would talk about how this moment in time was recorded. Uh, the other thing that I was thinking about was that I was looking for a form, you know, I was looking for a form to kind of study where, because for a while my, my work had become kind of formless. There was no like repeated elements, nothing that I was sort of studying in a, uh, traditional kind of sense about how do you how you make it. And um, I saw this Korean moon jar at the British Museum. And I just loved the kind of clumsiness and gracefulness that is uh, at play when you have these two thrown parts that are then stacked and put together. And so I, I fell in love with this, this, this uh, form. At the same time, the Stan Rhodes quote, um, speaking to the emergence of an artwork as an event rather than a formulation. You know, I uh, was doing these artworks that really were happening in events um, and then had the realization like, well, sitting down on a potter's wheel is also an event. And, you know, the thing that is made is this sort of captured moment of, of gracefulness, hopefully, and that's you know recorded in form. And so I began uh, trying to make my own moon jars, and this became a daily study, a daily pursuit. I would actually I'd go into the pot shop and I'd put on the talking heads and try to knock out like four or five of these every evening. And they, uh, they were clumsy, you know, they, they had varying levels of uh, kind of resolution. Uh, but what I liked was just the change between each one, kind of one thing going from the other. And when you place them beside each other, how they became sort of this family with different attitudes and characteristics and um, personalities. And so this was, um, the basis, this is the starting point for an exhibition that I did in Detroit titled Listener. When you walk into the gallery space, the first thing that you encounter is this series of porcelain vessels. Uh, they're all placed on the floor and they're um, made with porcelain, but totally unglazed. Uh, they are fired to cone 10, but they don't have any glaze on them so that, you know, what you see on the surface is the direct mark that my hand made on it. Uh, in the back part of the space, there's this steel structure that emanates these um, 
audio tones that were recorded from the bellies of the pots themselves. And what would happen was sometimes I'd be throwing on the wheel and I'd stack the second bowl on top of the bottom one and it would make this sort of parabolic chamber. So the, the motor of the wheel itself would start to hum, you know, through the pot, it would resonate through the pot. And I just thought like, oh, this, this is such a wonderful tactile experience of, of space, of this internal space of the pot, uh, this sort of life inside of the pot, like I needed to record that. And so that was being emanated out of the steel structure in the back. And uh, the thing that I most liked about this was the sound and the vibrating of the steel, the whole thing had this kind of magnetic quality where people would come into the gallery and they'd be like, how is this working? And ultimately you wanna uh, touch the, the metal, uh, leaving kind of these corrosive fingerprints on it that I thought um, created a nice relationship with the, the raw, um, finger marks, the throwing rings on the pots in the front of the space. So there's this sort of continued uh, look at touch and the way that one thing marks another and leaves, leaves its trace on it. Now, um, the, the other aspect of this show was that you'd walk through that main chamber of the space and come to the back and there was a 20 minute video. And the video is a portrait of my uh, pottery teacher, that my first pottery mentor, Richard Wukic. And within the video, he sort of talks through uh, his interest in clay, but also talking about it from a, uh, an interest in history and how it kind of tells this, this human story. And what I wanted was for people to come into the front of the space, have this very palpable kind of moody feeling, you know, this, the feeling of the, the mood of the work, and then come back in here and get more of a didactic information uh, that will then kind of color the way that you're seeing the front half of the space. And I just want to, this video clip, uh, I think I need to show just a few minutes of this. I mean, you go out and look at a Greek vase painting and look at the, how wonderfully and naturally the figures on these vase paintings are drawn. Um, when you go into these big museums like the Metropolitan Museum in New, in New York City and you see this uh, case after case of... of um, Greek vase paintings and you say oh, you've seen one you kind of seen them all and then you start really studying each individual figure and see how well drawn it is how how the anatomy is just uh, uh, so lifelike and uh, uh, and you think to yourself wait a minute um, this guy can this person could draw like Picasso I mean this person could draw like Raphael um, I, I just don't think you could top this, and 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 I, I felt this revelation once, and I came back and uh, I think we were at the museum, the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, and the the docent was uh, talking about these vase paintings, and I, I I looked and I saw this figure on this vase, and I started studying the figure, and I went, wow, that's really really a nice figure I mean this thing is so beautiful and I said to my friend Glenn who was always sort of like my father confessor because he read and thought about this stuff a lot and I said you know Glenn how could anybody aspire to be any better than these people he said this isn't about being better he says it's about being part of the continuum 
to be part of that stream of people who uh, have uh, have used art as a form of expression to be part of that just to be just to be in that stream with them to be part of that continuum okay uh, a few more just details from the show uh, and so that brings me to notions um, this work began in 2012 uh, but really didn't start to take shape or um, begin to be thought of as a possible exhibition or anything until I moved to New York. And um, earlier I talked about using some materials from my grandfather and these drawings are actually also made from by my other grandfather. <laughs> so uh, I've been fortunate to have all these uh, collaborators who I'm very close with. Uh, he started making these when I was uh, an undergrad and making pottery. And uh, he was watching the Antiques Roadshow and like seeing valuable pieces of ceramics uh, and thought like, wow, you know, that's, Trevor should make that. He should make the same thing and then it would be valuable. And that, you know, that's the ticket. Um, the thing was when he, when he drew them, you know, he created these just wonderful imaginative ideas. And, you know, I often, like, I have to wonder, was he looking at like a, a George Orr piece that they were showing on the Antiques Roadshow, or was it something more um, traditional and, you know, his drawing, uh, the imagination in his drawing just went wild anyway. Uh, but, so this was the original piece, you know, he made these, he was trying to tell me about it, and he was saying, oh, this isn't what it actually looked like, but, you know, you should try to make it. And I, I immediately took the drawing and thought, this is a great idea, and I have to try and copy it. And so this created a back and forth between us that lasted, you know, the last uh, couple years of his life where he'd make a couple drawings, I'd go make some pieces, I'd bring them back, show them to him. And, uh, you know, we kept sort of pushing it more and more and more, seeing what kind of crazy ideas he could come up with. And here's just some examples of the drawings. You know, I, um, I worked with these pieces and didn't quite feel like they were succeeding until I discovered, you know, this sort of technique where I would paint them so that they looked like raw, unfired clay. So they still looked soft, like wet clay. And I, um, you know, I, I had that idea just by seeing them in the studio. And it'd be after I sort of finished constructing them, before they were ever fired, I just thought, I just want to keep them like this. I just like this sort of fragile state that they're in right now. And uh, so that became this pursuit of how do I figure this out? I tried all of these sort of, I tried terracigelata and a lot of other more complicated ways of getting the surface uh, until I eventually just took a piece of clay into Home Depot and had them stick it under their color matching machine and got some paint that looks just like clay and the sheen does too. You know, and I like these sort of funny proportions that come up, this kind of snaggle tooth detail here. All of these things that, you know, I, um, I would have never thought of, but they're just wonderful to sort of interpret and they give me a, a kind of platform to launch off of when I'm starting to make uh, these things and think about how they could exist as three-dimensional objects. And so the way that I uh, like to show these is in large groups so that you can see sort of all of the different types of marks that are made. Uh, some of them feel like very heavy and like gravity is really having an effect on them where others seem sort of surreal and um, you know, how is, how is a raw clay thing standing up like that? Uh, but, you know, this for me embodies a part of my work where uh, this is an exhibition of this work, but it's an ongoing project. There's so many drawings that I have to kind of work through still, and I make multiple pieces from each idea, you know, until I really get one that, that I think uh, makes you look closer at the drawing and see all the, the unique sort of 
qualities of the, the rendering. Um, so, you know, this idea for me, it's really, um, I think of it like a campaign where I'm telling the story and there's so many uh, options for how it could be uh, told in different details. And here, for example, you can see this one shelf unit is used as uh, basically a container for all five of the individual uh, sketches on the page. And so here you have six drawings on one page that becomes these six objects on this shelf unit. You know, for example, this piece, uh, the drawing has it sort of placed like, you know, there's all of this empty space below it. And this is on a uh, Armco notepad. The, this is sort of the uh, company notepad from the, the mill. But, um, you know, I thought, how can I translate that into space? All of that empty space under, under this object and how it's sort of levitating up there. So this was placed up on the top back corner of the shelves. And then the next series of these, I, uh, I was making these while I was working at Greenwich House. And, you know, I, um, I just always loved the light in that clay room. And I thought these are painted, so they look like raw clay. They should be documented in a space like that also. And so um, these are photographed in the clay mixing room on the first floor. All of these things seem very much about um, elevation, weightlessness almost. Okay. Um, and so now I just want to introduce the video and then that's going to play for, it's about 14 minutes. So um, I hope I haven't gone too long, but um, I just want to say that, you know, like when the, uh, the lockdown happened, um, the previous work, you can see the sort of mindset I was in where I was thinking about making installations and uh, many of them had video elements. And uh, I always loved that sort of practice of making videos and the way that you can use the camera to the camera and editing to sort of control, control pace and control attention. And so when, you know, we sort of all ended up in our apartments or just, you know, just locked down, I was away from my studio and thinking, stop thinking about galleries, stop thinking about exhibitions. And um, I made a video piece here that I think just really uh, captured the feeling of that moment. And I thought, you know, that's the most important thing that I can aim for right now uh, is just purely using this observational approach to try and record what this this moment feels like and um you know i think that that's that's all i'll say and then i'll, I'll play the video and then we'll talk afterwards so if um hopefully this isn't laggy and hopefully the sound is good it's uh this is just a segment of the film and it's all in progress and this is a rough edit so just know Things may change, but um, yeah, here's an introduction to it. Skip this. I actually get here quite early, so I'm like the first one to kind of open the building in the morning. And I just feel like the building gets to like rest overnight, you know, feeling the like all the creative energy that's in this space, but then it is a little bit calmer.
first stop, I'm like checking the kiln room, like if any of the gas kilns are firing. The kind of week before the shutdown happened, we, you know, a lot of people weren't coming into class and, you know, like seemed like really kind of kind of ghostly here, you know, because it's usually such a bustling place. Um, and then I was actually the only person that was in the building, like after it shut down. Um, so <laughs> we needed someone to kind of, I mean, the building still kind of had to happen, you know, the boilers had to stay on so the pipes didn't freeze and, you know, things kind of <laughs> like had to be checked on. So I actually stayed here and was here in the building when, I mean, New York was shut down, <laughs> which was crazy. <laughs> yeah, I chose to like actually like hunker down and like live in this space. Just being around <laughs> like, like thousands of objects, you know, that were either waiting for someone to pick them up or waiting to be worked on or, you know, just like, it just kind of increased the amount of just like, intensity of you know just kind of feeling all of these people's work and like everyone's practice that had just like kind of come to like a complete halt the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, I was actually working in retail doing visual merchandising. I was laid off from my job in March. A friend of mine who actually used to work for Greenwich House um, saw that the pottery was hiring and sent me their email and I decided to apply and was fortunate enough to um, join this team even though even if it's a very weird time, it was very fortunate to join this team.
Do you need your brake pads? Like, what's the scoop? Yeah. No big deal. But you can't fix it because it's clay's too dry. So you could you could wet it and then smush it together. As I told you. With before. some other clay bodies you might be able to get away with that. But with porcelain you're never gonna be able to get away with just re-wetting this and re-smushing it. Because porcelain's too finicky. Just try it. Please. Or you could glue it. Well we can't glue it now, we have to glue it later. According to Susie, you can glue it now. <laughs> I'm not Susie. <laughs> you want to get Susie up here? No. Susie! Susie! All right. In fact, I would put it on a firing tray anyways right now because it's pretty fragile. So. I really like it here. I like the fact that there are lots of people. As I said earlier, I spent years in a studio by myself as a painter. And to be here amongst other people was really nice for me. And I think Derek was my first instructor. Please. Oh, there okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, but I made too many. Oh, oh. And, and I, I didn't play the sound. You know, the way it's happening. Are you bringing your first thing? Yeah. But it's like... Really? I think because clay is so tactile and so impressionable and so sensitive that um, for me teaching ceramics you know you would have to teach how to touch this is like my hundredth pinch touch <laughs> the work i made i think i think certain aspects of my work have to do with just compulsive behavior i kind of, kind of make the same figure over and over and uh, I, I kind of figured that when they came, became repetitive, I would stop. But, but that hasn't happened yet. There seems to be enough variation from, uh, from moment to moment that I continue with them. Everyone has their own sense of touch, their own way of um, kind of interacting with the material and navigating through that. And you can't really teach that, you, you know, the maker has to experience it themselves through their own sensitivity and their own sense of touch. And they may come up with something that I would have never been able to come up with or never thought about coming up with. So in that sense, I don't really, um, you know, I don't really, I'm not, I don't, I don't really know what I can teach. I'm more of a kind of a guide or a facilitator. Um, you know, if they have a desired result that they want to try and achieve, I will kind of help them along the way through the process to, to arrive at a, a result or a product, you know, that they are uh, curious about or interested in. Our last class is next week, that's the 11th, and the pottery closes on the 12th. So it's a good idea to finish up any work in progress. Send greenware into the bisque firing and get your bisqueware glazed. Some things to keep in mind over the next couple weeks. Clear your class shelves and start taking home personal items, tools, finished pieces. If any greenware is lingering on the shelves, either have it fired or stick in the reclaim buckets. Empty your locker unless you plan on continuing next term. Cups and cocktails, join us online with your favorite cocktail in your favorite cup to toast GHP's incredible faculty. They have done an amazing job adjusting their teaching methods to our new socially distant world. Uh, see you guys next week at the latest.
thinking about like flowers and these things and not that I'm a, a Buddha. Uh, you can't get away from the Buddha monks bringing flowers to the Buddha. <laughs> Like in fact, it's taking the imperfect and doing what you can, but it will never be. It will never be. At least these will never be perfectly symmetrical. Well, it's kind of nice, right? Now the sun and even more quiet, more gentle. I think that'll make it through. My whole session here, all I got to do is just remember those Buddhist monks a thousand years ago when they used to just pick up the flowers as they walked to the shrine and they weren't looking for the perfect flowers. And before the flowers, I think they would pick the bamboo off of the huts or whatever they had that fell off of the peasant hut. I'm so glad I did that. I, I oh, do like yeah. that shoulder now. I mean, I liked it before. It's, uh, yeah. Somebody downstairs did Chai Blue. No, uh, I think Yin Chin Blue on the top and on the red and then bird neck. I do Temple White and then bird neck. I'll probably do my Temple White. Yeah, like just bird man, uh, just temple white on the top. I have some cups downstairs, I'll show you. They came out of the kiln. And then I didn't get what I wanted because the kiln is different, but it's still so beautiful in that you can get the temple white and then the mixture, you can get some blue and then you get some yellow and then the brown from the bird man. And you can get like a like a really nice kind of landscape feeling, like you're looking up at a mountain. I call it my Rocky Mountain, you know, as in the Rocky Mountains out in uh, Colorado. Uh, yes, because, I mean, a gas kiln is, puts out such beautiful colors. And actually, I do this shower, but I think I'm gonna have to wait until coming back from lunch to do the slip. It's already a quarter to, damn. But this is pretty productive, huh? Bird mat, temple white, and chung blue with the slip. Okay. Okay, so um, can I stop there and open this up to uh, discussion? <laughs> I guess, Trevor, I want to start not with a question, but just to say um, how much I enjoyed that clip that you showed us, and I'm really excited to see the whole thing. Oh, thanks. Yeah, you know, that was, um, you know, we all had always discussed, oh, yeah, let's do a little preview. And then I realized today, oh, that never happened. Uh, so this was going to be brand new for everybody. And um, yeah, you know, um, I will say that uh, conceiving of this project, you know, I was thinking about the way that I kind of approach filming things and just using that as a way to pay attention to something. And and then like when the the fellowship came around, I was like, wow, there's like 500 people who care so much about this place and um, probably are very curious about what I'm doing. And so I hope, you know, I'm, you know, I'm just trying, I am trying to follow my kind of instincts in this and um, make a video that feels like the place. And as far as like my 
my goals, uh, you know, this is not about the history of the pottery, but I think, a, you know, my, um, like my dad would say, a piece of history. Um, something that I think will be interesting to look back on in 20 years. Uh, you know, I'm not keeping a journal through this, this period, this COVID time, but my, my artwork is sort of my way of always feeling out what's in the air. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to know, um, I don't know, um, like what's, what surprised you or um, uh, you know, what surprised you during this process while you're interviewing people? Um. Uh, hmm. the, the quietness of the studio, uh, because I, I felt like, you know, that's sort of like the secret that the technicians and the people that work there all know is just how amazing it is to work in when you know it's closed during the summer or during a holiday break and you get the space to yourself and um i think that you know right now that there's a, people working there who are very much enjoying that aspect of the unfortunate kind of circumstances uh that that we're all in um, but something that didn't surprise me is the sort of the love of the place and how, just how that came up in each person that I talked to and in different ways, but just that, you know, it's a community where everybody adds something and, um, I think requires not just a community, but it's, it's a place, you know, it's a place where everybody brings this kind of new dimension to it and it requires nurturing and constant input uh, to be so special. So, yeah. I gotta keep going with that. Oh yeah, that is um, a small sample. <laughs> <laughs> of, of probably what it will be. I mean, I'm, I don't have any uh, kind of duration that I'm aiming for. It will just be whatever feels natural. And, um, you know, that is maybe roughly how we'll start, like with, with Anjali opening up the studio in the morning and then following the course of, of a day at the pottery just the, the typical kind of cycles of the different classes that come in and out. You know, there's like a shot of uh, students in the afternoon waiting to get into the building. So there's just like 30 seconds of people standing around on the sidewalk <laughs> looking like they want to get to work. Um, and then I think that it may be like a day and a half in the pottery because I also recorded um, an interview with Kara Jean when she was working in there uh, after the studio had closed for the holidays. And um, she put into words a lot of things that like I haven't been able to uh, about the place and how, how and why it's so important to people. And I think that it will probably end with that segment where it's like, okay, shut down for the holidays. Then there's one person working there from a kind of employee and student perspective. Uh, fade out. Um, but, you know, just talking about the duration also makes me think about, like, just to, just to say, uh, like, what is the goal of this piece? It's, you know, I'm not making this to, to enter film festivals or to try to get on Netflix or something. It's, it's totally not about that. It's just about kind of observing and, you know, how, how can I be a part of this community? How can I um, create something that can be a part of, like that can look at this moment and be a part of the history of the place? Trevor, I, I'm curious, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, I'm curious, first of all, I'm not, maybe I missed something. This was the artwork that you did for your fellowship, was this video or were you actually constructing working in clay at the same time? No, um, not working in clay at all while I was there. And um, I really didn't even 
get around to editing at all during the time because I was just filming uh, daily life in the studio and also interviews with uh, people from, you know, students and faculty and staff there. So mostly what I was doing during the fellowship was just recording, just the mm -hmm. production. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could say a little more about um, how you arrived. At, I mean, you mentioned how you arrived at this idea, but mm -hmm. um, in terms of, at least for me, it, it's like really hard to do my work in at this point in time with the pandemic and it's kind of discombobulating. So I'm just wondering if you could flesh out a little more about your thinking um, of, on this project and, and the role, your role as an artist at this time. Yeah. Um, I always, I think about the sort of spectrum between like artist as innovator and artist as like observer or someone who like pays attention to things and um you know kind of talking through like my older work uh there was a lot of a lot of rendering a lot of expression and you know with everything sort of up in the air i felt like i wasn't um grounded enough to about my feelings about this time to do anything where I'm you know to make a sculpture of this moment would be like a really difficult conundrum for me mm -hmm. but um and then you know I if I would have had 10 more minutes I would have shown the video piece that I sort of initially made that like first month of quarantine uh and that was just in our apartment and, and um, there's like moments of the Brian Lair show on the radio that's just ambient uh, sort of narrating just that feeling of not knowing what was going to happen uh, but the thing was that that video felt like really accurate and that was satisfying for me as an artist and so that's uh, what then took me towards towards this idea. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I was really interested in all of the aspects of storytelling that you seem to be like continually um, like illuminating with all of your work. And I was curious uh, for you how storytelling through these more static objects um, is different than storytelling through video. Kind of what does each offer in the realms of storytelling for you? Uh, I think with three-dimensional objects, there's um, probably, you would expect more um, unexpected interpretations. Uh, with video, it really seems like you have a lot of uh, ways to structure and sort of control the uh, the message of it. But the you know the interesting thing with with sculpture is that it lives on uh, beyond the kind of moment that it was in. Like if I'm making pieces for an installation, that's essentially the presentation of of the idea, right? But then it lives on afterwards and it's like, how does it continue to, to tell that story? Where, um, where video has a kind of embedded uh, time scale that it exists in. So that, I mean, that's sort of the way I think about it, but I never, I never decide like, ah, oh, for the, um, you know, I just do what the sort of material that I'm working with uh, leads me to naturally, you know, it's, um, I'm trying to like squeeze whatever juice I can out of the, whatever I'm looking at or interested in. So it's, I, I'm not ever like making arbitrary choices between, oh, I want to do this in a, as a sculpture, or I want to do this as a video. Um, it's in, in response to the subject. What a beautiful so, 
uh, mm. Trevor to uh, squeeze the juice out of whatever moment. And, you know, this was fun early on for all artists, the first month, two months, three months. Yeah. And uh, just whatever. I was just struck by the um, consistency of your narrative through your, you know, working class uh, forebears and the, you know, wh whatever. I was just really, uh, um, there's and something you. terribly poignant about the stoppage and then the documentary aspect of, uh, it was fun at first. And then it says, hey, wait a minute. I, you know, whatever. It's just very touching. I love this place. Uh, the, and the amount that it holds. And Anjali is similar, similar uh, very powerful voice of the, the, the stoppage work needing to be picked up, work needing to be the arrested movement it's just something very compelling about it to me so uh, beautiful job so, thank you josh trevor ah okay <laughs> i got it <laughs> i was just um moved throughout about how much you lived in every moment that oh. you were experiencing and so saying the squeezing the juice out of uh every experience um, sort of uh, confirmed it. I mean, uh, so, you know, it's just, um, I was just impressed by that. I, you know, I'm always, as a New Yorker, always moving on to the next thing. And <laughs> <laughs> you really stayed with it. And uh, I found it, you know, just enlightening to listen to you and, and look at your work. Thank you. Yeah, this was um, an unusual talk because as soon as I shared my screen, I was sort of isolated. Like I couldn't see anybody or hear anything. So um, thank you. And, you know, this also something gave me a thought about Judy's question and what Josh was saying where, you know, I talked about uh, my dad's career because there was always this kind of discussion about what job title are you aiming for? And for me, artists always met like this person who gets up in the morning to sort of really uh, look for the truth in things, even though that's like such a romantic idea that I, maybe a lot of artists would be upset about. Um, but, or, you know, just to sort of be a remedy to all of these kind of corporate, you know, these negative influences. And so, you know, that's where this thinking came from, where it was just, what kind of work can I be doing right now? And, um, you know, hopefully it's, it's valuable. But I don't know. I'm just making it, and we'll see later on. Hey, Trevor, I wanted you to clarify something that I, as a former student and a friend and admirer of your work, um, clarified that uh, for notions, you neglected, I believe, to, to say that this other grandfather, uh, one was, well, well, this other grandfather was a, uh, he was a trucker. Yeah, truck driver. And so it seemed to me an important omission that, uh, that he, in trying to relate to you, hey, these are, as a ceramic artist, here are ceramic objects. You could make whatever. It seemed like an omission. I wanted to be sure that that, I, that you mentioned to the to everybody because I was so taken with that. Yeah, um, and I think that you see it in the drawings where they're so free of any like influence from art education. <laughs> you know, they're just the. Uh, pure creative activity. Um, and, 
you know, I, I it's like, oh, I don't want to start this talk with like, the, where are you from? How'd that influence you and all that stuff? Because it's sort of like so expected, but um, you know, just to say like a lot of the values that shape my work, I, I think were formed uh, well before I ever really had any sense of like what contemporary art was and what was going on. You know, I already had these sort of worldviews that then as I started studying art, I began to like see these things I wanted to make. Um, so yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Um, yeah, one grandfather was a mill worker, plastering contractor, and the other was a truck driver. And um, yeah, good influences. What was his reaction when you, like you brought a piece to him? Oh, he thought I was ridiculous at first because um, he would say, no, no, like that wasn't what it really looked like. You know, that's, I just can't draw. And, um, but that's the ultimate goal of that piece is to make one of those that eventually someday will end up back on the Antiques Roadshow and like be, you know, at the, mm -hmm. the value that he was sort of seeing. And um, so to complete the circle in, in that way, you know, but he, uh, it was sort of the first one that I brought back. He was like, oh, geez, you know, this isn't what I really meant. But then got a little laugh out of it. And uh, then we were off, you know, and then he started making me more and more drawings. And, you know, we were really working together after that. We appreciated it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Trevor, um, did did you say you got your grandfather got all those images from the antique roadshow is that where he got them that was the starting point uh that was the initial thing that made him think that he should he should make a drawing but um from from then on it was just ideas some i mean i'm sure that he would still see things on tv that you try to copy um like there was a sort of por a cast porcelain uh dog that they had in their place where he would put his keys and wallet and stuff like that, had a little bowl in it. And um, like he drew something that was sort of like that one time, but it was also a lamp or, you know, at, at certain points he started thinking about different ways that he could combine like two functional ceramic objects into one. Uh, but yeah, increasingly through the years, like the drawings became more and more from his imagination rather than things he was seeing on TV. Uh -huh. Okay. We have a, a few questions through the chat that I'm going to read out for you. Okay. Um, the first is, uh, hi, Trevor. I'm a big fan of your work and as a teacher. Um, oh, a fan of your work and your work as a teacher. Got it. Oh. <laughs> um, a lot of your work seems to come from a coll collaboration with your family. Any thoughts on a collaboration with your wife? Yes, yes. Um, Definitely something that we've been discussing and need to do. Uh, yeah, Claire is actually over in the other room listening right now. And, you know, I don't know why. We tried once and uh, I made this big bowl and then she like drew this beautiful image in it. And then I was trimming the foot a little bit more and basically it like flew off the wheel. It was a disaster uh, because I lost this thing. But yeah, that is something um, that we intend to do and just haven't gotten into the workflow yet. Um, and, you know, I think that every time I've moved uh, to a different, you know, living in a different place, uh, especially like moving away from home and being away from my family, I had to sort of figure out like, well, what can I get close to again? Or like, what sort of material can I really, I need that like very close relationship with something to, to instigate the collaborative work. So, yes. Okay, another chat question. Um, did you storyboard the film? What part, if any, did you draw uh, frames or use still photos to construct the film? No, um, I, I didn't storyboard. I just was drawing on my experience from being a tech uh, and sort of thinking about the different segments that I wanted. 
um, you know, the different sort of activities uh, from opening up the studio and pugging out clay so that it's ready for all the students. And then uh, morning class, afternoon class, glazing, loading a kiln. But um, none of it's storyboarded. I just film with, I just follow people around and film them and then interview them or vice versa and uh, collage it together. <laughs> so uh, I think that be, I don't do that because I just want to see what happens, you know, and I don't want to say, hey, oh, now go uh, mix the glaze or something. You know, I just want to follow what's naturally happening. So no, I didn't storyboard any of it. Um, and I have so much footage that I'm sorting through. So. We have any other questions from the audience? All right. Well, I, not a question, but just to say that I, I thoroughly enjoyed it and I'm really looking forward to seeing the whole uh, project completed. Yeah, it was very good. Thank you. Thank you. What's happening in the chat? Thanks, Trevor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for Thank you. you know being here. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. This was great. Yeah, if, if we don't have any more questions, yeah, just a big thank you to Trevor and a thank you to everyone else. And um, thank you, Trevor. Thank and you. we are um, aiming to screen the video in entirely this summer, right? That July, perhaps, or at a maiden clay. Um, we're gonna mm. see see what happens, but. Um, Yes, we will keep everyone posted. Yes. Okay, thank you all. This was great. Yeah, it was great to see everybody. Bye. Hey. Bye.